Chapter 13, Stifling the Scream. To the strong room, said Mr. Butcher in armour. Quick march. What do you think they'll get for this, said the dog. Transportation, mm, a few years of hard labour in Australia would do them the world of good. Yep, sounds good enough to me, said Mr. Butcher in armour. Thieving has to be dealt with very seriously. Frank and not Sheba were marched across the roof and down several flights of stairs. I was getting on with the worksheet, said Frank. Really, I was, sir. Too late now, boy, Mr. Butcher in armour said and pulled his helmet shut. I knew this would happen, said not Sheba. What have you done with Charlie, said Frank. No, I mean the mummy. It's been packaged up for the University Museum, said the dog. And we're going to Australia, are we? Well, we'll see what the judge says, said the dog. You'll get a fair trial. By now, they were down in the basement. Mr Butcher opened the door. Not Sheba and Frank were pushed inside and the door slammed and locked behind them. The only light was the thin line that came in under the door. Everything was getting too much for Frank. All he wanted was to be back on the coach, going home, and if necessary, being dropped on the scrap heap. Anything rather than this. He felt tired, alone, and scared. I'm tired and a bit lonely, said Frank. Me too, said Notsheba. Are you scared, said Frank. No said Notsheba. I am, said Frank. Notsheba put her arm around him and he leant towards her. It felt nice, but he felt like crying. I'm sure we'll be all right, said Notsheba. I'm not so sure, said Frank. Everything was so dark. And then came the noise. It was a kind of... <coughs> A kind of syrupy, dripping noise. A kind of... kind of bubble in mud noise. Oh, I know what that is, said Frank. They're going to drown us. They're going to fill the place up with water and we won't be able to get out. We're just going to drown in here. The ghastly syrupy noise went on, but now there were more bubbles. Or a little... It sounded like something was coming alive in mud. Suddenly, Frank felt a cold, damp hand close around his neck. Ah! He screamed. The hand moved to his mouth, stifling the scream. Ah! There was a horrible gurgling sound in his ear, and Frank heard a voice say, This is the first day of your death. Not Sheba was breathing fast in the dark. They could see nothing. Then the voice said, ha, I'll get an Oscar for this, Frank, you know. The Mummy Strikes Back. Best motion picture, best leading actor, best cold, damp hands. Charlie, it's you, shouted Not Sheba in a voice that showed how glad she was. So they haven't packaged you up yet? Frank was still shaking. I'll turn the light on, said Charlie. You mean it could have been light in here all this time, said Frank. Sure, said Charlie, but I like the dark effect. Don't you remember um, Alien 2? Charlie switched on the light. There was a moment of relief. <sighs> Not Sheba and Frank relaxed back. And then suddenly, Frank sat bolt upright and screamed again. Ah! There, about an arm's length away from Frank's face, was a large glass jar the size of a bucket. And in the jar was a man's head. It blinked and a few bubbles came out of its mouth. <sighs> That's what made the horrible noise, thought Frank. Don't point, Frank, said Not Sheba. It's rude. She was staring very hard at the head. Frank, don't you see? Look, look, he's black. I think I'm going to get the answer. I just feel it. Do Oscar winners get a lot of money, Frank? Said Charlie. And then, not waiting for an answer, I'll spend it on... Fizzy water. Yeah. Gallons and gallons of fizzy water. I love fizzy water. I love the way it bubbles on your tongue and then a few minutes later makes you <laughs> yeah, makes you burp. 
not Sheba, moved closer to the head. Who are you? she said to it. Pem or we? bubbled the head. Where'd you come from? Australia, he said. Australia, said Frank. They told us we might go to Australia. Is it nice there? The head moved slowly. It might be nice now. I don't know, he said, when people were transported there. It was hell for them. If you're transported, you'll be chained together and work all day in the boiling sun, stone breaking till you drop dead with exhaustion. Were you transported? said Frank. The head smiled sadly. My friend, my people reached Australia 40,000 years ago. That's older than you, Charlie, said Frank. <laughs> I'm a rising young star, said Charlie. How come you're here now, said not Sheba, to the head in the jar? I was a rebel. Lord Chilton's younger son came out to Australia to seek his fortune. Whenever he tried to clear the forests, he found that there were people living there already. My people, the Koori. So he killed us. We fought back. Sometimes we won. We raided their places at night and took away their animals they put in our country. They shot at us. I was shot seven times. They chained me up, but I escaped with the chains still round my legs. My people came to believe that nothing could kill me. Again and again, we raided their places. It was only us. Yeah, it was only us they were terrible to. I saw them do things to their own people. Time and again we watched them from the bush and saw them beating naked men with long whips till their backs were just streaming with blood. First they brought them to our country in chains and if they did anything wrong, like talk when they were eating, they beat them till they were nearly dead. If they were doing such murderous things to each other, I suppose it was small wonder they did the same or worse to us. When they got me, they killed me, beheaded me and sent my head back to the young man's father. <laughs> I was a present, a novelty for visitors to this great house to admire. Not Sheba listened, fascinated. Am I a Koori? she asked. Pemmel, we stared at her. No. Once they sent soldiers after us, and amongst them was a man who wasn't like the white man. He was black like you. Well, where did he come from, said not Sheba in a hurry, as far as I know, said Pemelwee. England. Oh, no, said not Sheba. I thought I was so near and now I'm so far. Yes, said Charlie. A bridge too far. Now, that's a great war film. Frank, Frank. Frank was still thinking about what Pemelwee had said. Frank, a war movie. Why didn't we think of it? Charlie went into film dialogue. The tanks are moving westwards, Robson. Have they got air cover, sir? HQ on the line, HQ on the line. Oh, tea with two sugars, sir. No biscuits left, sir. We use them to mend the holes in the tank, sir. Shut up, Charlie, said not Sheba, still concentrating on Pemelwee. Frank was looking round the strong room. It was a junk room now, piled high with all the odds and ends and old collections that the Chilterns hadn't put on show upstairs. Bicycles, books, model boats, Paintings, vases, old shoes, heaps of it. Frank got up and began to look at what there was. Charlie turned to Not Sheba. You know, they want to dissect my stomach. Wickham Scientific Film Unit are planning to make a documentary film. I can see it now. The scalpel cut across my stomach. The slow peel back of the skin. The incision into the stomach the careful removal of the material, the deadly serious commentary. The contents of the ancient Egyptian priest's stomach were removed and an extensive series of tests were run. Hey, what are these, said Frank, and he opened an old cupboard. Inside, dozens of little straw figures were dancing up and down. I will have the world's most famous belly button said Charlie. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the story about Frank's adventures at the stately home. Maybe the next time you visit a museum or stately home, you'll be able to look at the objects on display there and wonder where they came from 
and what their story is. You might want to write your own story inspired by them. Frank also appears in Your Thinking About Donuts, which you can find here on Kids Poems and Stories with Michael Rosen. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Just click on the bell to keep updated with all the latest vids that we post here.